Hey, hello everyone, it's your brother Tim. I just want to give an encouraging word tonight. I just feel led to talk about the importance of seeking God and putting him first. I know uh, that's really something, a, a, a theme that I often uh, mention in my broadcast is the importance of putting God first. But I, I really believe that when you seek the Lord, I really believe that that is probably the best decision that you can ever make. And I want to talk about that tonight. Um, I want to um, talk about the topic that I have is seek him more, seek him more. And uh, I know that this was a blessing to me. I know it's going to be a blessing to you also. Um, I know you're probably tired of me hearing that, uh, saying that, but I, it's the truth. All right. And uh, I really believe that God is going to bless this word. It's already blessed, but I know that you're going to be blessed once you hear it. And especially when you decide to apply it to your life. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke 19. And tonight I'm going to be using the King James Version. All right. And it's not really uh, anything that's hard to be understood. It's not really difficult. All right. And so just follow along with me if you're not used to this translation. I'm pretty much going to um, really uh, paraphrase everything anyway. All right, so you're going to get a clear picture of what I'm trying to communicate tonight. So this is Luke 19. Um, I'm going to start at verse 1 and just follow along with me, starting at verse 1. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans. And he was rich, and he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press because he was little of stature and he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him for he was to pass that way. So I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to pause for a little bit. Let's talk about these first few verses here. Here we have Zacchaeus and the Bible says in the King James that he was a publican or which means simply that he was a tax collector and also um, it, it mentions that the fact that he was rich and I want to stop right there for a moment because oftentimes in, in, in the world, in society today, people allow their money or, or their wealth or their lack thereof to really distract them from God, to distract them from their faith. You, either you have money and if you have money, you, you, you feel like you, there's not really a need to seek the Lord, there's not really a need for God, even though you know you cannot save yourself. Isn't that what the Bible teaches? You can't save yourself. You can't buy salvation. But there is just this silly notion, you know, with people who allow uh, their money to dictate their mood, their, their money to dictate what they do and how they think and, and how they live. They think that they're OK, that they're they're fine because, you know what, I have money and I can do whatever I want. And it doesn't mean that everybody who has money thinks that way, of course, but that, that there is a lot of people who believe that, you know what, if I have money, then I'm OK, I'm fine. All right. But it does mention here that he was a rich man. Oftentimes when the Bible talks about rich men, oftentimes they have that same type of thinking that I'm fine, I'm rich. I have wealth. I have I have gold. I have silver. I have everything that I need. And guess what? I don't need God. But here we have something that's really different with Zacchaeus because he was rich. All right. And he was rich, but he still made a decision to see about Jesus. And let's look into that. And he sought to see Jesus who he was and could not for the press because he was little of stature. And what did he do in verse four? And he ran before everybody else. That means he ran before the crowd and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him for he was past that way. All right. And so what he, what he did was he the Bible says that he was very short. He was a short man. And so that the challenge that Zacchaeus had was the fact that, OK, he was probably not in the in the beginning in the in the he was probably like either in the middle of the crowd or maybe he was behind the crowd. So he wrote it. He wasn't in front of the crowd. And so what he had to do, because he knew Jesus was coming, 
He knew that he had to go to a higher place in order to see Jesus. So he knew Jesus was coming. Of course, he heard about Jesus. I'm pretty sure he, he heard about his miracles. He heard about what Jesus can do. And so he began to inquire about him. There was an interest inside of his spirit to say that, you know what? I got to find out who this Jesus is for myself. And I really believe that that is the starting point for anybody who really wants to go in the kingdom, go far in the kingdom of God. Anybody who wants a relationship with God, you have to make a decision to seek God for yourself there has to be some type of interest into spiritual things and this is what Zacchaeus had he said you know what I'm a rich man but I don't care about my wealth right now I want to find out who Jesus is and so what did he do he decided to climb up what the Bible calls a sycamore tree in order to see Jesus all right and so I like this word sycamore tree because and some of you guys probably already heard this before, but this can actually be used with a play of words. Now, when you look at the word sycamore, you can you, you almost see that the word um, in the, the really the, the phrase seek him more. All right. When you look at the word sycamore, it almost sounds like sick. Seek him more. That's what it sounds like. And I've heard teachings on this, and I really believe that this is something that's quite amazing. And it's not a coincidence. I really believe it's in the Bible for a reason. And so what this means is Zacchaeus, he had to go to a higher ground. He had to go to a higher place if he was going to see Jesus. What is the application for this? Oftentimes in our lives, you know, we're, we're because of and what the crowd represents, the crowd represents those distractions. The crowd represents all of the things or the people that block us from seeing Jesus, that block us from seeing God, that really block us from having a true relationship with God. And so what we have to do is do we do we settle and stay behind? Stay behind the crowd. Do we do we just decide that, you know what? Listen, you know, I work a nine to five. I'm tired or you know what? I'm doing this right now. I'm in school. I have this going on. I have that going on and I really can't go to church right now or I'm just tired by the time I get home from work. And every time I try to read my Bible, I end up falling asleep or every time I try to get up and pray, I end up oversleeping and sometimes I'm even late for work. And so. Here we have Zacchaeus. He chose to go to a higher place in order to see Jesus. We have to have that same type of thinking if we expect to see Jesus. We have to decide to go to a higher place. And how do we go to a higher place? We have to choose to seek him more. We have to make an effort to get up and to pray and to sing praises to God and to decide to open up our Bibles to read it. And when we read, have the full faith that God's going to speak to us through his word. And this is how we see seek him more. See, in order to really experience the blessings of God and not just the blessings of God, to hear the voice of God, that's a blessing within itself, if you ask me, because a lot of people are confused. And it, I remember when I was younger in my faith and I would often ask my pastor, like, how do you hear the voice of God? What does God sound like? And he said, you know what, Tim? Listen, you got to get into your Bible. You got to get into the word of God. And when you get into the word of God, that's how you begin to pick up on the voice of God. And I'm here to tell you today that when you make an effort and open up your Bible and not only read it, study it, not only study it, but apply it to your life. Now you're going to be able to pick up on the voice of God when he speaks to you. All right. And so that's that's just a little tip on how you're going to be able to hear the voice of God. And so here we have Zacchaeus. He decided to go up the sycamore tree. In other words, he decided to get a closer look. He decided to seek him more and look at what happens as a result of that in verse five and when Jesus came to the place he looked up look at this he looked up and he saw him and said unto him Zacchaeus make haste and come down for today I must abide at thy house and look at what happened in verse six and he made haste that's exactly what he did that means he he, he, he got up there immediately, all right? He was very excited. That means that he moved quickly. Did he drag his feet? No, this is the exact opposite. He made haste and came down in what? 
received him joyfully. And verse seven says, and when they saw it, they all murmured, murmured, saying that he was gone, gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. Let me read that again. And verse seven says, and when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. All right. So there's a few things going on right here. All right. But one thing I do uh, want to mention is the fact that when Jesus saw his effort, that's when he released his favor. I'm going to say it again. When Jesus saw his effort, I'm pretty sure Jesus already knew that because Jesus, I mean, he was he was a prophet. Jesus, he knew his father's voice. He, he knew he was a prophet, meaning that he knew what was going to happen before he before it did. So I'm pretty sure that he knew Zacchaeus was going to be in the tree at that time. But this is what happens here. He really he looked up into the tree and he saw Zacchaeus and he knew that it took effort to get up into the tree. And so what happened? He rewarded him. What does that sound like? That 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 says that the, the, the Bible in the, in the book of Hebrews, it says that, you know, um, in order to seek the Lord, first, you must know that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. All right. So keep that in your mind as you read this. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And because Zacchaeus did not remain where he was, but he chose to climb up the sycamore tree or he decided to seek him more. That's when he earned God's favor and he gave him a reward of his presence. And so this is what we have right here going on in this particular verse. So he rewards him with his person. He rewards him with his attention. He rewards him with his favor. Now, in verse seven, of course, everybody don't like that. And of course, you're going to have some people who complain. You're going to have some people who trust me, they will find something wrong when you decide to go after God. You're going to have some people trust me. They're not going to see the positive side of it. They're only going to focus on the negative things. They're going to say, oh, you know what? Your religion. I'm glad that you have that. And that's good. It's working for you. But you know what I, what I think about people like that? I think that they need a crutch. And I, I just think that really some of these Christians, they're not really strong enough to handle certain things in life. And so they have to have this, you know, imaginary figure who loves them, who they can go to when they go through tough times. And you know what? Listen, if that's how they feel, that's them. Let them think whatever they want to think. Let them believe whatever they want to believe. What does Joshua say? As for me and my house, hey, we're going to believe the Lord. We're going to put our faith in the Lord and we're going to serve the Lord. All right. And so you have to make a decision regardless of what people think or what their opinions are. You have to make a choice to seek God and to put him first and to believe that God will reward you accordingly. And that's exactly what Zacchaeus did. And I want to say something else, too. See here, like I said before. He earned the favor of Jesus because Jesus saw his effort. In other words, he was chosen by Jesus. So whenever you are chosen by God, you're not going to be celebrated by everybody. Whenever you are chosen by God, you better believe that you was a lot of times you're going to be the bud of people's jokes. You're going to be criticized. You're, whenever you're a leader, period. All right. You're always going to be the person who gets the blame for everything. All right. You're always going to be the person that people go to and they're just going to say that, you know what? Well, you could have done this differently and you could have done that. And you're going to receive construct constructive criticism. Sometimes it's constructive criticism. Sometimes it's just plain criticism. You know, sometimes it's just people. Let's be honest. Sometimes they're just hating on you, you know, and they don't want to see you do well. And I want you to understand that oftentimes, you know, um, in the Bible, God uses the people who are rejected. Jesus Christ, the son of God, he was indeed rejected by his own people. He was rejected by those who he was sent to save. And he was heartbroken when he, when he was getting ready to go to the cross a week before that. He looked over Jerusalem and he wept because he talked about how oftentimes he desired to, you know, just to gather his people, to embrace them, just like and just to embrace them like a, a hen would, would embrace her young. But instead, they rejected him. 
When he came to give them life and so much more, they, they only saw, they only saw the negativity. They only saw what was wrong and, and they only focus on what he didn't do. And they rejected him as a result of that. And Jesus even said that the stone that the builders rejected has now become the chief of the corner. And so I want you to know that when you are chosen by God, that rejection comes with the position. Don't worry about what people say. You may even lose your job. You may even lose favor with the boss because he don't understand your faith and he don't understand why you take time out every Sunday and you go to church and you and you don't participate with everybody else when they tell dirty jokes and when they talk about silly things and you choose the higher road and you walk away and you don't put people down in order to move up, but you choose to love everybody. Trust me, you're not going to win popularity contests when you do these things but you will win favor with the king of kings and the lord of lords and when you have favor with god it's greater than anything else on this earth you got to understand that's what matters the most favor with god favor with god above and the book of proverbs talks about the favor of god is to be, to be obtained above rubies and diamonds and gems above riches all types of treasures i don't care what it is when you have the favor of god you have what you need. That was something that the Lord really tried to get me to understand in my younger years because I thought that, you know what, if I had more money or if I was making more money, I can do this and I can buy this. But God was telling me, Tim, you really don't need more money. You just need a revelation of who I am. You need to see me as someone who is able to open up any door. You need to see me as someone who is a way maker, a miracle worker. All right. We love to sing these different songs in church and I love these songs, too. And this is a part of our worship. But how many of us really believe in what we sing and what we pray? Sometimes when it's time for us to step out on faith, often, oftentimes we're afraid to move. Because we are afraid that when we step out on faith, that God may not meet us there. But we got to believe and so guess what? Going back to my point, you're not always going to be liked by people when you're chosen by God. You're not always going to be winning popularity contests when you're chosen by God, but it's still all good. See, because oftentimes when God, even in, in scripture, and this theme has always been throughout the whole Bible, whenever God begins to move upon the earth, what does he do? He uses a man. When it was time for the nation of Israel to be delivered from the Egyptians, what did God do? He raised up a Moses. When Moses died, what did God do? He raised up a Joshua to take his people into the promised land. When it was time for him to redeem mankind, what did God do? He came in the form of a man, Jesus Christ, to do for us what we could not do for ourselves, what nobody else can do. Everybody else tried, but nobody else was worthy. Nobody else could have done what Jesus did. God has always used a man. God is calling you. Yes, I said it last week. I probably said it last month. I'm going to say it again. A lot of you guys who are listening to me right now, watching me right now, the reason why you're having a hard time, the reason why you don't quite fit in with everybody else, some of you don't even fit in with your own family, is because you're chosen by God. When you're chosen by God, that means that you're sanctified. What does sanctify mean? It means to be set apart for the master's use. And whenever God sets you apart, that means that he sets you apart with a purpose in mind. I don't want you to be discouraged. I want you to celebrate because your life has purpose. I don't want you to try to be like the world and, and try to fit in and blend in with everybody else. We got so many Christians or people who call themselves Christians who are blending in with the world. You can't even tell if they're saved. I'm not trying to put anybody down, but I know people who call themselves Christians and they don't even have enough courage to pray over their food around worldly people. They struggle with praying, saying the grace during lunchtime at work. And if, if this is you, listen, there's always hope. You don't have to stay there, though. Don't stay in that place of fear. Don't stay in that place of cowardice. 
God loves those who believe. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, the just shall live by faith. And if any man draws back, my soul will have no pleasure in him. I want God to take pleasure in my life. I want God to take pleasure with what I say and what I do. And let's go even further than that. Even what I think and what I meditate on, my motives, I want God to be pleased with that. See, when you're in love, this is what you do. We love Jesus. And so we want to please him in all of our ways and everything that we do. I'm going to move right along. I hope this is blessing somebody. And so they were they were hating on him because he was chosen. Verse eight says, and Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, behold, Lord, the half of my goods. Listen to this. I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, this day is salvation come to his house, to this house, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. All right. Before I even close that out, let's go right back to verse eight. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, behold, the Lord Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, what is he doing? I'm going to restore to him fourfold. What am I saying right now? I'm telling you right now that when you truly repent, it's more than just an apology. When you truly repent, you know what you look to do? You look to do exactly what Zacchaeus did. See, Zacchaeus had an encounter with Christ. He had an encounter with Jesus. And because he had that encounter and because Jesus came to his home, salvation came to his house and it changed him. And he really demonstrated true repentance, meaning that he gave more than just an apology, more than just, oh, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. No, he looked to restore what he once stole. So what does this mean to him? So that means that when you truly repent, if you really want to get close to God, that means you're doing more than just saying you're sorry, you're asking for forgiveness. You're asking God, Lord, what can I do to make this wrong right? What can I do to demonstrate love? What can I do to help someone who I may have harmed or hurt before? Yeah, I see what am I doing? I'm looking to restore that which was lost because that is the same thing that Jesus did when he saved you. He restored your soul. He restored you. You were once lost, but now you are found. And so now so that we're kingdom kids and we're in the kingdom of God and we're saved, that means that, look, I'm looking to be a blessing now I'm looking around Lord how can you use me today I want to do something different I want to do something radical I want to not just keep my faith to myself but I want to go and be a blessing I want to go and pass out food at the shelter I want to go and go on a mission trip and go over to Africa or go to these different foreign places so that I can demonstrate the kingdom of God to say that if God can change me then he can change you if God can restore me then he can restore you because if he do it for me he'll do the same thing for you this is the God that we serve see there I have never met a man that had a true encounter with God that was ever the same and see sometimes here in America we have this wrong idea of what we think this is this is not just getting dressed up on Sunday morning and looking nice and, you know, putting on your Sunday's best and bringing the family out to church. No, that, that's a part of it. But this is a life change. This is something that will really challenge you to the core. To make you want to be more like Christ. 
This is why we do what we do. This ought to be the motive. Man, listen, I'm here because God saved me, and plus I want to be like Jesus. I remember, man, and some of you can really relate to this. When I was younger, my dad was my hero, All right? And, and, that's, and it's that way for a lot of young men. Your father is your first hero, all right? Before Spider-Man, before the uh, X-Men, for some of us who love sports, before Michael Jordan, uh, I remember I was a big Mets fan. I used to love Dow Strawberry. But before all those guys, the first man that I met was my father. And you couldn't tell me that my dad wasn't the strongest man. You couldn't tell me, all right, even though my dad was barely six foot, and he only weighed about 190 dollars, 190 pounds, excuse me. All right, but you couldn't tell me that he didn't have the biggest muscles. You couldn't tell me that he couldn't lift the boulder. You couldn't tell me that he couldn't fly, because my dad was Superman. And you know what? See, in the kingdom of God, we Jesus talked about how if you don't have the faith of a little child, you can't really enter in. And you know what that means? That means that we, oh, we have to have this childlike faith that we can really believe our father to do anything. We have to really believe that our father can do anything. There's nothing that he won't do for us. That our father is able to lift the heaviest load. Our father is able to remove the, the heaviest burden. Our father is able to do things that we can never do. Our father, when he shows up, there's no reason to be afraid. Our father, when he shows up, we just feel secure. We don't have to have all the answers because daddy's there. And our daddy, he knows everything. You sleep better at night. I, I used to go home, you know, when I was a child from playing with my friends, I'd go home. When I saw dad was there, I just knew that no matter what happened, it was going to be all right. Tonight was going to be a good night because daddy's home. And you know what? During youth ministry, I would encounter a lot of young people who didn't have that growing up and my heart would go out to them. And that really made me want to be a father figure for them because they didn't have daddy. And, and sometimes we wonder why some people don't have a, a, a good sense of seeing God as their heavenly father is because their earthly father wasn't in position to be what he should have been for them. And I see that and I, I see it every single day. I have that, you know, amongst family members. I have that amongst my friends. You know, daddy's not there. And so people suffer because daddy's not there. And if I'm talking to you tonight, I want you to know that even though your earthly father may not have been there, you have the heavenly father that he'll never break a promise. You have a heavenly father that keeps his word. You have a heavenly father that cannot lie. You have a heavenly father that can do anything. All you have to do is put all your trust in him. He'll never leave you hanging. and He won't let you fall. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. That's what he does. And so here we see. This man was willing to restore everything, even whether he was gained by lies. Now he's even confessing what he did wrong. He said, listen, not only will I restore it, I'll restore it not twofold, not even threefold, but fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, this day is salvation coming to his house, this house, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Zacchaeus had a lot to rejoice about. Salvation, meaning Jesus, came to his house. I really believe that not only was Zacchaeus saved, but Jesus said salvation has come to your house. I really believe that if he was married, his wife got saved. The Bible doesn't say that. But if he had children, his children got saved. 
I really believe that God turned everything around in his house because he made a decision to seek him more. I want you to know tonight that when you decide to put yourself down and take up your cross and follow Jesus, how God will just line everything up. How God will come into your life in a way like he never came before. How God will take the things in your life and just place them in order. He'll remove the confusion. He'll remove the clouds that's over your head. He'll remove the heaviness that's in your heart. And he'll make everything lighter. He'll make everything brighter. God has the power to heal you right where you hurt. God has the power to heal you in that area that you keep covered up and you don't even want nobody to see it. I guarantee you give it over to God and he'll heal you. He'll heal you in such a way you won't even be ashamed to tell your testimony anymore. You'll tell anybody who's willing to listen that, yeah, I used to do this. I used to look at that. I involved myself with this. I was tied to this person, but it doesn't matter anymore. You know why? Because the things that I used to do, I don't do anymore because God set me free. Scripture says, let the redeem of the Lord say so. If God set you free, you better tell somebody about it. Jesus says who the son is set free is what is free indeed. If God has done anything in your life. You have a responsibility to open up your mouth and believe that God will use you to bless someone else who may be still in bondage. You got people around you that are still suffering. You got people around you that don't have the same conviction that you have, but you have a word and you can really help them. But who are you helping if you're afraid or you're ashamed or you don't believe that God can use you? If you don't believe it, then it won't happen. God is a God that is moved by faith. You have to believe. So I charge everyone who is watching me tonight. Step out and believe God. Don't worry about who is going to walk away from you. If you decide to seek after the Lord, if you decide to change, if you decide to give your heart over to Christ, don't worry about the, the repercussions. Don't worry about what people are going to say about you. Just worry about what may happen to you if Christ comes back and you're not saved. Or if you leave this world without Jesus. Worry about that. Because that is something to worry about. Now that I'm in Christ now, I really don't know how people do it. That choose to live their life as an atheist or agnostic. I don't know how people do it. See, really, you, you believe in something. You have faith. You just have faith that maybe you're a God and you're in control. Maybe you have faith that there is no God. You do have faith. You just have to change what you put your faith in. Me, I'm going to change I'm going to choose to put my faith in the one I can't see because I know the evidence is all around me. When I look around, when I look at my family, when I look at my life, it's evidence that there is a God. When I look how I can forgive somebody who done me wrong in the past, that's all evidence. It's not that hard to see. I'm telling you, all you got to do is sit down and get quiet. And begin to focus on him. It won't be long before you start to thank God that, you know what, things may not be exactly the way I want it to be. But, Lord, I'm thankful that it's far from what it used to be. Count your blessings. Of course, the enemy, he wants you to focus on what you don't have. And if you're not careful, you'll find yourself complaining all the time. Complaining about your spouse. Complaining about your mom. Complaining about all these people on the job and you're complaining about how you feel and you're complaining about your feet and how achy they are. Complaining about how tired you are and how sick these people on your job make you feel and you're always complaining. 
And you forget the fact that you're blessed because you're alive. And you got breath in your body. And you woke up this morning. And there's a lot of people. Don't mean to sound cliche, but not everybody woke up this morning. Yeah, you might be complaining about your achy feet. And then you met somebody who had no feet. And they were smiling more than you were. See, God, he knows how to humble everybody. And he'll humble me and he'll humble you. But you got to put your faith in him. I'm just about done for today. I pray this word blessed you. And before I go, I want to pray with you. I pray that you will have a desire to seek him like you never did before. I pray that you will have a fire inside of you that the world will not put out. I pray that while you're alive, that you will choose to seek the Lord. I pray that you will experience God's best. I pray that you will experience and see the glory of God in your life like you never saw it before. I pray that in your weakest moment, that you will receive the strength that God has to offer. I pray that you will understand that by the grace of God, you can do anything that God has called you to. I pray that you will have enough wisdom to know that if God called you to it, he's not going to walk away from you. He's going to take your hand and lead you through it. I pray that you will grow in such a way that you will understand that being like Jesus is the greatest life that you can ever live. I pray that you will know that communication with God is the best communication that you'll ever have. I pray that the love of God will flood your heart and that you will understand that God's love is greater than any love that you'll ever have for anyone else or even yourself. The love of God is real. It's tangible and God has it for you. I don't care what you did last week or even last night, this morning or whatever have you. I want you to understand. God will take you from where you are right now and he'll take you to a new place. But you got to put your faith in him. God desires to use you. He desires to change your life. But he is a, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He's not going to force himself on anybody. He won't force himself on you. But he's knocking, knocking on the door of your heart. If you hear that knock, open up your heart to him and he'll make your life brand new. Heavenly Father, I pray for everyone who is listening. I pray for everyone, Lord God, that may be going through a trial. They may be going through a test. I pray, Lord God, that they will make a decision to get close. Let them not be discouraged, oh God, by what they see, by how they feel even from lack of support from others. But I pray, Lord God, that they will know that if you be for them, it's more than anyone against them. I pray, Lord, that you would do something new inside of their heart. I pray, oh God, that you will fill them with your spirit. I pray right now, Lord God, even for those who are listening who are not saved, that they will allow you to come into their heart in a new way. And so that you will change their life and that you will live your life through them. I pray, Lord, that you will make everything new. I sense in my spirit, oh God, there are people who are tired because their life is like a pattern and they're going in circles and all they do is have the same experiences and they're tired of seeing the same things and they're tired of all of the negativity and it seems like nothing changes. Let them know, Father, the reason why they see what they see is because they need to give their heart and life over to you. And you will make all things new. Father, I pray, Lord, for a divine encounter. I pray, Lord God, that you that you will start a fire within them. I pray, oh God, the fire will spread like wildfire and that it will be contagious. And that they won't be able to keep it to themselves. Father, have your way. Lord, show yourself strong. Do a new thing. Now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. If you prayed along with me, 
make a decision today that you're not going to settle, but you're going to seek him more than you did before. God bless you, and thanks for watching.